guys started as contract killers. People paid for us to take care of certain things. And became a vicious, menacing army. We're like the most feared gang in Maryland. Our numbers are like ridiculous. Their goal is to kill somebody. They have no problem with that. That was the goal, strike fear into the hearts of our enemies. They are armed and dangerous. Very much along military lines. If somebody brings harm to me or any of our comrades, we will do whatever we have to do to neutralize that threat. They are Dead Man Incorporated, or DMI. People should be very worried about DMI. They're on the roll. We're power overall. We see ourselves supreme to any organization in the system. Baltimore, Maryland is known for crab cakes and cobblestone streets. But this idyllic waterfront is in the middle of one of the toughest hoods in the country. Much of the city's crime is fueled by a large drug trade. Get arrested or convicted here, and you'll exchange these cold, mean streets for the violent world of the Maryland prison system. The prison is pretty much a city within itself. Every crime pretty much that takes place out on the streets in some shape or form takes place inside institutions. From murders, extortions, assaults, robberies, uh, probably some type of sexual crime. The list goes on. This Maryland prison official, Captain Jones, asked to have his identity concealed. Just because you lock him up and put him behind the wall, he doesn't stop. He or she doesn't stop their activities. These prisons are predatory societies dominated by gangs. Nine times out of ten, it's gangs. Gangs at war. On the inside, alliances can save your life. And belonging to a gang can mean the difference between life or death. And when I got to prison, it was basically like, either get down or lay down. If you wasn't involved, you was getting preyed on. It's pretty much what it was. If you're by yourself and you're not with nobody, you only have two choices. You either get chopped up and flown out or you're uh, going on protective custody. You can't win. In Maryland's prisons, this is especially true for white inmates who are in the minority. Typically in prison, white guys are going to get preyed upon. They're like marks. White boys, I guess everybody think white boys are bitches. Not here. In Maryland, one group has flipped the script. This mysterious secret gang is Dead Man Incorporated, AKA DMI. DMI's main objective is brotherhood, loyalty, respect, by any means. Just a unity. That's what I like. Bloods, Crips, they kill each other. They war in prison a hundred different sets. They war against each other, and that's like nonsense. 27-year-old Nick Hornberger is a career criminal. When he was just seven, Nick used a knife to steal a scooter from another child. I had a lot of brothers and sisters growing up, so I was basically let do what I wanted. Nick was a good kid up until he started school. And from first grade on, it was trouble, trouble, trouble. He'd leave school, we'd have to go find him. I mean, we never knew what he was up to. I mean, it was terrible. None of the neighbors would let their kids play with him. Nick became addicted to cocaine. He has spent six of the past nine years behind bars. He joined DMI while serving time for home invasion. It's just cause of fear. That's what attracted me to it, the fear. Just knowing I would put fear in somebody's heart. Just knowing who I was. Walk down a compound and they get out your way and nothing they can do. Chalk it up or you're up, pretty much. Nick has committed a long list of assaults in the name of DMI. 
Couple stabbings, busted a couple heads, beat people up. The most violent attack occurred during lunch when he stabbed a fellow inmate 14 times. So I just like attack him, like space out, like see red, don't even know what I'm doing. The inmate lived and then walked away. Then ran out, got away, didn't get caught, did it smart, didn't get caught at all. Nick's pension for violence got him elected DMI's Sergeant of Arms. He's responsible for building the gang's arsenal. Just make sure that there's weapons readily available. If something time of war, something like eminence gonna happen, make sure there's knives, locks, batteries, something that's gonna do damage. When uh, you got a, a jail full of people running around with knives, you ain't gonna have guys jumping out there and being disrespectful. DMI is considered the most dangerous gang in the Maryland prison system. Their strict code of secrecy means that little is known of their inner workings, but they've grown quickly to almost 1,000 strong, making a fierce name for themselves along the way. They're willing to fight. They're willing to be violent with DMI, will fight anybody, and willing to go at any cost to kill somebody. Everybody thinks they're violent. They are. I was in the pen 72 days, and I think I saw about 45, maybe 50 acts of violence in DMI against other rival gangs. DMI kills to serve its own agenda, but its specialty is murder for hire. If DMI agrees, the gang will carry out a hit in exchange for money or drugs. Their goal is to kill somebody. They have no problem with that, or that's what they were told to do. They're following out orders. Stab them, hit you in your head with a lock, drop a weight on you, bank you. I mean, nine times out of 10, it busts your head or stab you. Death happens a lot. Assaults, assault weapons, knives, blunt objects. It could lead to murder. The goal is to kill them. 30-year-old Ricky Tolson has spent most of the past decade locked up. The teardrops on his face are evidence of his crimes. They represent hits that I've carried out in the institution. Ricky, a former heroin addict, is serving time for assaulting a police officer. You know, I came in the prison, uh, a kid with a lot of issues, but I always ran from my challenges or my obstacles in life instead of standing up and facing them. Ricky found the ability to stand up for himself only with the help of DMI. They helped me out when I came in the prison as far as food and necessities until I got on my feet. And it's hard to survive in those environments by yourself. Ricky quickly began doing hits for the gang. The first was against a prisoner who killed a DMI family member. Someone needed to be taken care of. And at the time, it was a difficult situation carrying out the hit. So they were trying to find somewhat of a ghost to carry out this, this hit on this inmate. I felt like I owed him some kind of level of respect, and I felt as though they needed my help at the time, and I did what I had to do. After the incident, Ricky was asked to join the gang. There was a lot of knowledge brought forth by joining DMI. It's given me the knowledge and the strength that I need to succeed. I don't have the fear that I had years ago. He became a dedicated soldier of DMI, embracing its ideology. We don't want things to come to bloodshed. We don't want to harm others. But if somebody brings harm to me or any of our comrades, we will do whatever we have to do to neutralize that threat. What Ricky didn't anticipate was that DMI's biggest threat was itself. February 2007, DMI members were noticing a disturbing trend members who once prided themselves on secrecy and brotherhood were turning on one another. I noticed a lot of in-house fighting, uh, power struggles, a lot of bad bones put out on each other. Personal grudges, a lot of hitting one another, uh, 
I just kind of took a step back from that and was like, wow. Ricky found himself in the thick of the battle when a power struggle developed with a fellow DMI member. On February 14th, the dispute turned vicious when Ricky was attacked by members of the gang. I was ultimately stabbed up pretty severely by other members of DMI in an in-house fight, and I nearly lost my life there. Ricky may have survived, but his body bears the scars of the attack. There, those are up my arm. A metal homemade knife, yeah, and a straight razor. Yeah, and I had the underneath my, my elbow torn open. Yeah, it sucked. And I'll never forget the day, because that really changed my perspective as far as DMI as a whole. I wanted to seek revenge. The gang's leaders realized that they'd lost control and knew they needed to do something drastic. It's just people running wild too much now, so I'm trying to do something about it, but it's just we don't know what we're gonna do. He lost control, it's out of control. DMI threw down an ultimatum. Members needed to start living right or face the consequences. The unity's gone. The unity's gone. Baltimore, Maryland. The neighborhoods here are lined with traditional row houses and local businesses. The serene appearance belies the city's violent nature. And its most vicious criminals are housed in Maryland's prisons. Many are gang members who continue the lifestyle inside. Dead Man Incorporated, or DMI, was born and bred inside these walls. Detective Brown knows the secretive gang well. He asked to have his identity concealed. Their ultimate goal is they want to be a top-notch criminal enterprise. They'll fight anybody. They're not going to back down from anybody. So that's very intimidating in the prison system. DMI, a relatively new organization, was inspired by another long-standing prison gang, the Black Gorilla Family. BGF, a large anti-government African-American gang, has controlled many of Maryland's prisons for decades. The Black Gorilla Family, a really strong national gang. BGF is always looking to continue their dominance with inside. In the late 1990s, Harry Rourke, a.k.a. The Rock, was serving time for robbery with a deadly weapon. In order to survive, Rourke desperately needed allies. We've always had a few uh, Aryans and white supremacists. We've always had a few outlaw bikers. We've never had a, a strong Caucasian group in the Maryland prison system. Work started to hang out with the BGF because he agreed with their beliefs. He wanted to join the BGF, and uh, he's got a lot of associates inside there. Unfortunately, BGF does not accept white members. Even though Rourke wasn't allowed to join their ranks, the Black Gorilla family respected him. William Kern was incarcerated with Rourke in the late 90s. Good size dude, but he's not a real big dude. But you watch people try to go at him. I see people try to stab him and things like this, and they weren't very successful. From what I hear, he just was cool with the BGF, and he like took to him, seeing he like had a lot of heart, whatever. He was tough. In 1998, BGF decided that Rourke could prove useful to them. They gave him permission to start his own organization, and he became DMI. Rourke joined up with two other white inmates, Jane Sweeney and Brian Jordan. The three men founded Dead Man Inc. The reason they were formed in the beginning was to bring all the Caucasians together, to bond together so they weren't picked on anymore. Um, they can reap some of the same benefits that some of our other gangs do. 
many of DMI's operating procedures and beliefs were based on what they had learned from other gangs. John Smith asked to have his identity concealed. Smith is one of DMI's earliest members and was attracted to the gang's political leanings. It's an organization that's against the government. And the government is who we see as our number one enemy. A lot of it is against tyranny, opposition, the administration, our religion. We believe that a lot of it was man-made, created for population control or for control from others, that people that believe in religion or uh, certain bodies of government are, are weak-minded and they use that as a crutch. I would say DMI are smaller than some of our gangs just because of the way they do things. They kind of think things through a little bit. They definitely want to uplift the communities that their kids are living in, their families and loved ones are in. Unity was the gang's backbone. Membership was for life. And sharing any information about DMI with a non-member was punishable. Members like Little Chris, who joined in 2004, were attracted to the solidarity. This is being there for one another. To carry yourself as a man and, you know, act like a man. It's a brotherhood. It was designed for the advancement of someone to overcome recidivism, the things that bring us to prison, you know, uh, neglect, the neglect of our families, the hurting of others. The strict rules and secrecy weren't enough to make DMI a power inside. Initially, they were viewed as just a small bunch of white guys. It was a notion that would soon change. They had to get a name for themselves. This new Caucasian gang coming about DMI, no one knew anything about it. And the only way to get that respect in their eyes was to step out on the limb and be more violent, more vicious than anybody else. I got stabbed here, here, and here. They wanted to survive hostile environment. So their way was survival, survival of the fittest. You know, that's why they became so aggressive. These were their last ones. I was trying to get money from somebody. To prove how dangerous they were, and to earn some capital, DMI started killing for hire. We, we did hits, contract uh, hits. Uh, people, you know, they paid for us to take care of certain things or whatever. Whatever you owe, if we do the hit, that's what we get, is what you owed. Inside of the Department of Corrections, I believe you could call them assassins. That's what they made their bones on. Not necessarily killing people, but sanctioning individuals. One of their first clients was the Black Gorilla family. We were known as the hitmen to do little jobs for them. You know, when this stuff started, it was to be on an equal, you know, you help us, we help you. To join DMI, you had to be locked up in one of Maryland's state prisons, and you had to be white. But the racial policy didn't last long. Soon the gang began to accept all races. Their strategy paid off. The gang soon numbered up to 1,000. Little Chris witnessed the spike in numbers. When I became the Ahmad, there, there was only maybe like five of us. Yeah, and uh, I went on lockup for a while, came off, and there was like 50 people on the side. So it was like, grew real fast. DMI's membership spread beyond Maryland as inmates were transferred. The gang soon appeared in both the Virginia and Delaware prison systems. By 2007, DMI was big enough to stop taking work from other gangs and severed its ties to the BGF. It grew so big that uh, we ended up separating. We got as big as the organization that we were like uh, riding with. We are not connected anymore. Back in the day, we believed in the same thing. But some of the things that they did that we didn't believe in, it's just started building over the years, and you know, that's why we separated from them. DMI had become one of Maryland's most profitable and feared prison gangs by the time Nick joined. That was the goal, strike fear. It's like now, like, all right, we've shed so much blood, it's like we don't even have to do nothing. People, they just fear us. 
You can be by yourself in a prison. Ain't nobody gonna mess with you because they know what their consequence is. Mess with me, I'm gonna come back with 30, 40, and you're done. The Maryland Department of Public Safety and Correctional Services quickly realized it had a problem. DMI founder James Sweeney was transferred to a facility in Beaumont, Texas. Then Brian Jordan was shipped to Louisiana. Maryland state law prohibits the system from explaining the reason for the transfers. DMI's national membership soared, soon reaching 10,000. With its leaders now spread across three states, the gang started losing control of its members. As DMI's members are being split up to Louisiana, Texas, three founders are split up, you're seeing a kind of break up in the unity of DMI itself. You kill the shepherd, but the sheep scatter. So you have everybody trying to grasp whatever they can, and it caused a lot of chaos and tension from within. prison gang has grown so large it can be found in all of the state's penal <laughs> institutions. Five years ago when I started with the gangs unit here at the department, we had four to five validated gang members, period, in our database. Today we have over 320, and approximately 50% of that is DMI. DMI actively recruits, but becoming a member isn't easy. Sponsorship in the state prison system is the only way members can be brought home. DMI members refer to each other as DOGS, an acronym for DMI Against World Government. When one dog sees another dog, they say a special greeting to show unity. Flesh of my flesh. And then we have, uh, we say, uh, ain't change. And that's what be the answer to that. A new DMI member is known as a pup and is on probation for up to 30 days while the gang conducts a background check. They check uh, your, your criminal record just to see if you're an informant or if, you, if you're a rat. Something that would be detrimental to their cause. Hey, you ain't allowed to be no homo. <laughs> you ain't allowed to be a rapist. You ain't allowed to be a rat. And uh, when you do a background check, it's up to you to find out about that person. Pops are chosen for their skill set. Certain people are bred for certain things. Some people are fighters. There's different types of people in DMI. Some are used for um, other other reasons besides their violence, besides trying to kill somebody. They might use them for finance, or they might have some type of manual labor where they know how to sharpen stuff, so they might use them as teach people how to make weapons in prison. They have money, maybe they can front the money for some other members to get drugs. Some people are con artists. Some people are hustlers. Depends on what their intentions are and what they want to do. If they're fighters, then we send them out to fight. This former DMI member asked to have his identity concealed. He was an accountant who became the gang's finance officer. It entails just making sure supplies are always there, make sure there's money flow, a constant money flow. Whether it be in the prison system, whether it be tobacco or drugs or porno magazines, um, something as simple as fruit from the kitchen could bring in money. If a new member makes it past the probation period, he's given the most sacred of information. The one thing only members of DMI know, the whisper. It's most of our rules and principles basically binded in the one short oath. DMI members must be able to recite the whisper on command. Not being able to say it can get them killed. 
Trust me, if you can't spit when they say spit the whisper. If you can't, it's supposed to like just get on you right there, beat you. In 2007, a DMI member slit the throat of someone who claimed the gang, but was unable to say the whisper when ordered. No DMI members will reveal the sacred oath. I can't do that. <laughs> I don't know. You're not supposed to hear no whispers right here. I think that's what they call it, a whisper. Detective Brown agreed to share part of the mysterious vow. I pledge my allegiance to this unit for life to assist my brothers in strife. And if I should fail, then I shall fail, fail, fall under the knife. The middle part, I, I generally memorize and have it documented so that if I do a G-check on a DMI gang member, I can go ahead and challenge him to see if he knows the whisper. If he doesn't know it, then pretty much he's probably not inside. Once a new member has memorized the whisper, he will remain on probation for up to one year and will be at the bottom of DMI's strict power structure. It's set up more like an army almost. Um, they're scouts, they're soldiers. Everybody has a specific job. At the top of the DMI structure are the founders, Perry Rourke, James Sweeney, and Brian Jordan. They're called the Supreme Commanders, or SCs. They rule DMI nationwide. Below them is a team of elected officials called a unit who report to the SCs. Then like a unit is five seats. Commander, Lieutenant, Field General, Sergeant Arms, and Finance. There is one unit per prison, and they manage inmate activity, weaponry, money, and membership. The gang has grown so large that in Maryland, they've added a new layer of hierarchy between the SCs and the units, the elders. We've just recently created the elders, and I was chosen as, a, as one of the elders. There's five of us in the whole state. Uh, we kind of take the place of the SCs and direct orders throughout the system. My ability to lead people is probably a little better than most. That's why I was chosen to be in that position. I've been tested my loyalty as far as putting in hits to be able to control and, 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 and protect my comrades, stuff like that. The elders also go by another name, cleaners. Those are the guys who are supposed to keep that structure together and get rid of you if you're not going to live up to their code of conduct. They should be cleaning and cleansing people who are, for example, drug dealers, pedophiles, addicted to heroin. Because DMI has become so big, what they do is to help monitor the commanders and the units, different areas, and also make sure they're doing the right things and to help flush out people who aren't worthy of being D. Those who live up to DMI standards are allowed to wear the gang's patch. One popular tattoo for DMI members is of a dog. He's got red eyes, which is a symbol for a guy in DMI who might use muscle or power. The pyramid found on the back of the dollar bill with the eye at the top is another commonly seen DMI mark. All C and I on the top of the Egyptian pyramid, which is most common tattoos for DMI is the pyramid with the all C and I in it. This stems from the Illuminati. It uh, set out to depict Christianity as a man-made religion. The illuminated oversees all the enlightened ones. The eye represents like strength and knowledge to know all. The pyramid is like power, foundation. The numbers 4, 13, and 9, which correspond to the letters D, M, I in the alphabet, are also popular. 4, 13, 9, that's the my four on. Yeah, it's the letters of the alphabet, fourth letter D, and so on. It's just a reaper, that's all. Just a reaper. I must have done a thousand tattoos. DMI is careful not to draw unwanted attention, but members will occasionally throw hand signs in the shape of a pyramid. While they do not fly colors like other gangs, they subtly incorporate black. You can tell he's DMI 
Also, because you're wearing a black jacket and also the black bandana at our left pocket. That's the key thing. A lot of them will wear black wristbands that they'll make out of socks or clothing. BMI also has its own alphabet and language. These change frequently to avoid detection by prison guards. We have what we call speakeasies. But they change so often that it's pretty much impossible to keep up. The speakeasy is nothing but the code words that uh, the DMI use to communicate back and forth with each other. For example, uh, Barbie doll might be uh, speakeasy, maybe a code word for the police. Barking backwards may be the speakeasy term for the Crips. <laughs> All of DMI's mandates are spelled out in their paperwork. Members like Ricky Tolson view the guidelines as a how-to manual. It teaches us to be a better person, to endure whatever consequences we may bring, to become a man, to accept responsibility for our actions, stick up for one another, stick up for yourself. The paperwork includes 23 rules that gang members must follow. One thing that kind of stands apart about DMI's paperwork is it's very charismatic in what it is. It, it sounds really good when you read it. It sounds formal, it sounds organized and thought out. It's very much along military lines. When gang members break rules, they face punishment or sanctions. It could be 30 seconds to a couple minutes of uh, being put on the wall, which is getting your body beat for whatever violations you may have violated. You could write essays. You could be given a fine. You could be sanctioned as far as a workout schedule. The most serious violations result in much harsher punishment. These are known as COD. If these codes are violated, the result is immediate termination. See, you break one of them, it's like, it's like homosexuality, talking bad about your dogs, leaving your brother in a time of war, stuff like that. They're like, you break them, it's like death. That's punishable by death. Snitching also often results in death. Members can only accuse one another of snitching if they have proof in black and white, such as a police report or a deposition. If a DMI member is found guilty, the punishment is almost certain. It could be fatal. Baltimore, Maryland. Dead Man Incorporated. Or DMI started as a small white prison gang and grew to be an estimated 10,000 members nationwide. We're like the most feared gang in Maryland. Just numbers alone, I mean, our numbers are like ridiculous. The gang's three supreme commanders were now scattered across the country. Perry Rourke in Maryland, James Sweeney in Texas, and Brian Jordan in Louisiana making it easier for the gang to grow. DMI is active in upward to maybe 14 different states. Virginia, West Virginia, Pennsylvania, uh, New York, Florida. So obviously, we have some in Texas now, and Louisiana. By 2007, DMI's size began working against it. The gang had compromised its standards and started letting anyone in. Soon, everyone was claiming DMI. Members like Little Chris and William weren't happy. A lot of people just recruiting anybody and it just ain't happening. It's not supposed to happen like that. And people gathered up in these county jails, breeding, bringing people uh, into the organization for numbers instead of what it was really supposed to be for. The new recruits were considered infiltrators, not legit members. The difference between the DMI and the state and DMI and the county is we don't recognize DMI county dogs, the ones that became a dog in the county, as dogs. They're just hangers on wannabes. They're 
flunkies. More often than not, the more trouble than they are good. Nick Hornberger started seeing a difference in how the gang operated. Everything that's just going. This place like been going. It's like when I was I was in prison, but it was a hundred of us. And it was just nothing. No unity at all. Backbiting, backstabbing, all that. DMI is is in a downward spiral. And it's because of the infiltration of a lot of people that really technically shouldn't be involved in this organization. Old school DMI members like John Smith witnessed the system breaking down. I was down in penitentiary this past summer, and there was some stuff went down between three other organizations and our organization. And some of the so-called dogs who still stood there and watch all the dogs get stabbed up. It was evident that the gang's cardinal rule was no longer respected. If one DMI member is getting ready to fight somebody, they're always, if there's someone on the tier, their job is to have their back at all times, so that person won't get hurt. Ricky, a high-ranking DMI, soon found himself in the midst of the battle. In February 2007, Ricky was in a power struggle with other DMI members who wanted to wrestle control away from him. Tensions grew, and on February 14th, reached a boiling point. Ricky was jumped by DMI members and stabbed repeatedly. He barely survived. The attack changed his view of the gang. That was really a hard pill to swallow. That was definitely a test of my loyalty and faith, because I, I wanted to seek revenge. But that was really at, at a point where I started to see how bad things have gotten within DMI. And from that point on, I've, I've, I've really looked at it in a new light. I feel like most of my enemies are from within. I don't trust nobody. By 2008, Captain Jones and his colleagues sensed that the Supreme Commanders of DMI were losing control. That's when you start to uh, see a lot of conflicting things being said to each other through interviews. You see a lot of things start to take place that generally or normally wouldn't happen. Just being disrespectful to one another, saying I'm not listening to A, I'm listening to B now. William says the gang turned on its own, with members accusing other DMI of being snitches. You have guys trying to uh, assassinate other people and uh, as characters. If you got somebody in this organization that don't like you or knows something about you, they'll go and uh, spread things about you. The gang started carrying out hits on each other. We're constantly battling amongst ourselves. It's hard to trust your comrades, wondering if they're going to be the ones that end up putting a knife inside of you. Finally, DMI's Supreme Commanders decided it was time to act. They told members who weren't legitimate or who didn't want to start living by the gang laws to get out or else. The gates are open, but they don't do what they need to do by then, and you're still claiming they're going to find out where the real dog is against you. get bit. Maryland, 2008. Dead Man Inc., or DMI, a brutal prison gang, had taken hold of the state's prisons. Membership had grown too big for the gang's leaders to control, and members were now turning on their own. I had underneath my, my elbow torn open. DMI was locked in a bloody battle with itself. Something had to change. The gang's leaders issued an edict. Members not following gang laws must abide or get out. And those illegitimately claiming DMI had to leave immediately or risk the consequences. Anyone else who wanted to leave could do so until April 13, 2009. The date was symbolic, corresponding to the letters DMI or 4139 in the alphabet. 4139, like just you got a pass. Get a pass now to walk, no consequence, no repercussions. Just you just don't say you're a dog no more. Drop your flag and walk away. While some renounced the gang, others hesitated. A lot of people are afraid to leave 
because they feel like it's a setup, because at one point walking away would be fatal. Nick Hornberger was one of those who decided to leave. In January 2009, he was released from jail. I don't want to live that life no more. I mean, I done started the process by not affiliating with no members. I'm not talking, I've, had, I've seen two of them, but I didn't stop and talk to them. I drove straight past. Though DMI has promised freedom for those who want to get out, Nick worries it won't last. I fear there's going, there might be, there may be retaliation. There may, may be. Make it back to the seat, uh, I'm quitting. I'll be ready for it when it comes. Little Chris is unwilling to walk away from the Brotherhood. I mean, a lot of people don't got a lot of things. And it's like your family and the inside. Whether it's good or bad, you're still going to give it your 100% and stick together and try to work everything out. I consider it's my family. For William Kern, DMI is all he knows. It's with anything else. It's, it's, good, and it's good and bad. I don't know. I, I don't have nothing to compare it to, I don't think. I guess it's just my life. Ricky Tolson also decided to stay DMI. He's helping remove those from the gang who didn't walk, but are no longer welcome. You have in-house cleansing, which is going on now, to try to, to weed those people out so that we can get back to the beginning and how things were then as to the way they are now, because we are definitely off the path where we once were and would like to be. It is up to them to go out and siphon out the non out. So you're not worthy to be a part of BMI. We no longer need your services. I just see myself surrounded by a lot of cowards, uh, a lot of dudes with crazy agendas, I think, gives us a bad name. That makes us lose respect. Ricky remains proud of what DMI has given him and takes his vow unto death seriously. I've, I've quit at almost everything in my life. I don't feel as though I, I'm going to quit at this, regardless of how much I have to go through or, you know, how much pain it's afflicted upon me. Even so, he admits his time with Dead Man Incorporated has changed him. I've become a lot more colder towards people. I'm not going to say I don't have any feelings, because I do, but, you know, I'm less remorseful towards people. I've definitely become more violent. That scares me. DMI's future still hangs in the balance. A rift has formed between Supreme Commanders Perry Rourke and James Sweeney. They want to go in different directions. Rourke likes to keep DMI the way it is, allow African Americans to be a part of them, still being uh, close to the BGF. And Sweeney, to my understanding, he wants to get on the more, uh, I guess, radical side of it, more of the white supremacist side. DMI is starting to appear on the streets of Baltimore. For now, it is still predominantly a prison gang. But that may change when founder Rourke gets out. He is scheduled for release in 2015, but could be released as soon as 2010. Many believe he'll organize DMI on the streets. Until then, some say splits within the gang are inevitable. Others are certain that DMI will prevail and once again exert power over all. There's no doubt about that they're dangerous, but when their main member gets out of prison and can organize them, that's where the danger is. The danger for us is in the future. People should be very worried about DMI. They're on the roll. It's a reality and it's serious, and there are consequences that are rendered, and it could be life or death.